Well, good morning, everybody, and welcome to the Well Church. My name is Marcus, the Family Life Pastor. We want to say welcome to our church, welcome online, and to all of you, a happy Valentine's Day. We want to let you guys know that our church loves you, but more importantly, God loves you. Amen? So let's show the world, especially those around us, our family, our friends, people here in our church, people online, those around you, show love by being Jesus to those around you. Amen? Well, I just want to invite you to, oh, actually, I want to, before I invite you to stand, I want to let you know that if you would like to uh, have any questions for us, have any connection with us, if you have any praises, any prayer requests, we would love to hear from you by, if you're here, you can do that by filling out the connection card that's right there in front of you. And if you fill it out and, and uh, put it in the little brown box in the foyer, we'll be able to uh, hear from you and know how to pray for you, know how to help you answer any questions. Uh, if you're online, you can do the exact same thing by going to thewellypiper.com, to that sermon and blog section and fill that out. We, uh, either way, we'll be able to hear from you and be able to pray for you. So I invite you to stand with us this morning as we read this month's Bible memory verse. Mark 8, 34 to 35. Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. Whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me and my gospel will save it. Mark 8, 34 to 35. Father, I just want to thank you ultimately for the ultimate uh, expression of love through your son. We thank you and we praise you and we want to just spend this entire time worshiping you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Morning. So good to be here with you all, and thank you for joining us online as well. We all miss you guys, and we're looking forward to when we can all get back together. Um, I want to open up this morning with just a bit of a uh, bit out of God's Word. Um, this is Lamentations chapter 3, starting in verse 21. This I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I will hope in him. We serve a faithful God. Amen, church? Amen. He is steadfast in his love, and he is always gracious and full of mercy. So let's worship him this morning. He's worthy of our praise. Amen.
may be seated. sin washed away in your blood to punch to make sense of it all I know that your love makes my heart scandal of grace you died in my place It's all. That is our desire. We long to be more like you. Father, as we draw closer to you, would you mold us and shape us into the image of your son, Father, through uh, the songs we sing, God, and through your word this morning. Father, I pray that you'd ready our hearts and our minds to receive you through both these songs and the word that Pastor Ryan will bring, God. We long to be more like you. There's nothing no one that compares to you. There's nothing and no one that is beside you. Father, we worship you this morning. And as we continue with our worship, Father, through our, our giving, through these tithes and offerings, Father, we want to seek to honor you, Lord. And 
as we've been faithful, Father, we want to be faithful with what you have given us. So, Father, help us to give now in this time out of a, an overflow of thankfulness, an overflow of joy, an overflow of gratitude for who you are, God, and for all that you have done in our lives and for our new birth. So, Father, would you bless these tithes, bless these offerings, use them to further your kingdom. We surrender these to you and ask your blessing. Jesus' name, amen. So just a quick reminder, if you're here this morning, you can fill out the offering cards in front of you and drop them in the little brown box on your way out. Or if you're online, there's a banner right there with all the different ways that you could give this morning. Be seen. His presence is enough. He hides me in his feet. He wraps me in his love. He serves my heart to see. My life is in his hand. He is my confidence. He keeps his promises forever and amen. He's gentle with my heart. He knows each tear of blood. There's healing. Father, it is so good that you are a God who keeps his promises. You've promised us so many things. You've promised us life, and you've promised us um, just a relationship with you and an ability to love others that 
transcends all explanation of this world, Lord. And we just thank you for the, the restoration of our souls. And so, God, as we are coming here today to, to worship you and to hear from your word, we just ask that you would continue your work in our lives. We, we ask that you would continue to, to draw us closer to you. And, Lord, help us along this path as we choose and, and commit our lives to follow you. Thank you, Lord, for your great love and, and this love that is just embodied in Jesus Christ. And so we, we thank you for that, and we ask now that you would lead us and that you would guide us today. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Well, it's good to see you all this morning, and thank you for, for, for making the effort to, to brave these freezing Southern California winters to get here. And um, I've been in contact this week with friends from all around the country from from Florida, where it's in the 80s, to Pennsylvania, where it was just frozen, and then from Alaska, where it's really, really frozen up there. And um, I'm just really grateful to be here. You know, we get a little bit of wind. Um, it kind of messed my hair up this morning a bit, but, um, you know, it's going to be all right. So um, we're glad to be here and glad to be right here right now because God has a purpose for you in this place at this moment. It's no accident that you're here this morning. It's no accident that you're in Yukaipa or wherever you may find yourself around this country. It is no accident. God has a purpose and a plan for your lives and it is good to be here. And, um, you know, as we, as we come, there, there's a lot of stuff going on around. I don't know if you've noticed that, but in our, in our nation, there's just a lot of things happening, a lot of things going on. And, and a lot of things are vying for our attention. And the question I want to ask you this morning is, is what captures your attention? What is it that, that grabs at your mind like a magnet and pulls you in and, and sets the focus of your lives? For me, I, I struggle with this because just about everything distracts me. I am, I, I, my wife says something about attention deficit disorder when she talks about me, um, um, she's I, I just find every single thing interesting. And it's not that I can't stay focused. It's just that I focus on everything. And when you focus on everything, you really focus on nothing. And that's how I find myself. I'm very easily distracted. And mostly it's just in my mind. If you looked at me, you wouldn't say, oh, that guy's really distracted. You would just say, oh, he's just a normal guy. But, man, I'm like, I'm like oh, shiny things, you know. And I'm just like all around everywhere. But there's another way to ask this question. Rather than what captures your attention, another way to ask this question is, is what are you looking at? What are you looking at? You know, it's like, hey, what are you looking at? Huh? Are you looking at me? You know, th that question, what are you looking at? What is the thing that captures your focus and has you looking around and focused in on that one thing. What is it that you're looking at? We're going to look at that question this morning. And we're going to look at it in light of our memory verse for this week. And the memory verse is Mark 8, 34. And you guys have read it once before. But uh, let me read it to you again. And kind of let that verse kind of soak in and permeate where you're at today. Because Jesus says, come and follow me, and, and, and he asks that question of us, what are you looking at? What are you looking at? In Mark 8, 34, it says this, Then he called the crowd to him, along with his disciples, the, the crowd, the big group of people around, but also his disciples, and said, whoever wants be my disciple. If you want to be my disciple, if you want to follow me, you must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. That's what Jesus says. 
you know, he has the way of saying very simple things that have deep ramifications in our lives. He just explained to the apostles and to his closest disciples that he was going to go to Jerusalem and he was going to be killed. And you remember Peter took him aside and says, oh, no, you're mistaken, Lord. No, no, you're, we have other plans for you. And then he summoned the whole crowd along with his disciples and he began to disclose that suffering and persecution are going to mark the journey for anybody that wishes to follow him. If you want to follow Jesus, he says, it's going to be a difficult road for you. We have this crazy notion that if we follow Jesus, everything's going to be fine. All sunshine and unicorns. Now, they had already experienced the cost of leaving their families, their homes, their occupations behind. And, and, and they went, did that to follow Jesus. And his teaching in this passage reinforced their absolute, the necessity of their absolute commitment to him. To follow Jesus would cost them everything. What does that look like for us right now? Three, two thousand years later. What does it look like in our lives? You see, Jesus made it real clear that, that faith is not just words that we mouth. He made it clear that a saving faith is characterized by self-denial, cross-bearing, and submissive obedience to him wherever he calls you. And in this passage, he gives us three commands. If you're studying the Greek language, they're called imperatives. They're, they're verbs that have the force of him saying, these are must be haves in your life and one of them is negative two of them are positive the the negative one is that you must deny yourself you must deny yourself oh do you know what deny means deny in 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 the original language means to disown or repudiate Okay, disown. You have to disown yourself. I don't know about you, but I like myself. In fact, if I'm honest, I, I should be since I'm standing up here. Um, if I'm honest, almost everything that I do revolves around myself. Don't be all judgmental on me because I know you're the same way. We see this world as this grand stage and we're the lead actor in our play. The most heinous thing to all of us is to come to the realization that we are at best supporting actors and actresses in the middle of this. And oftentimes I find myself as just an extra. My, my description in the credits would be man walking in the crowd. So the negative, disown, repudiate. If you disown yourself, you give up your rights to be your own owner. That's tough. Then he gives two positive commands in this verse. You deny yourself as the negative. The positive commands are take up the cross. Well, that's nice. Carry the instrument of your own execution. And then the third thing is a positive follow me, follow Jesus. So we deny ourselves, we take up our cross, we follow Jesus. Today we're going to follow, we're going to focus on the first of the three imperatives that he gives here. The, the first is to deny yourself. So we're going to talk about this. And, and this word deny is such a strong Word. It just means to disown completely. 
disown it. You don't own yourself. You know God bought you. And you need to recognize who the new owner is. Uh, every Christian should get a sign and wear around your neck, under new ownership, you know, and walk around. Same word to deny is used when Peter denied Christ. See, we're supposed to do that with ourselves. And, and, and it's the same with Jesus and his denial in heaven. To anyone who denies him, he's going to deny them. That's, that's what he's saying. You need to deny yourself. And the point was those who wish to follow him have to be willing to disown yourself and give up everything for his sake. Are you willing to do that? That's a tough question. I, I don't ask that question lightly of you. I don't ask that question lightly of myself. Am I willing to really put aside myself and follow after Jesus? And when we deny ourselves, we, we have to abandon a couple of things. We have to abandon, first of all, our own self-righteousness. If you think that you're, you know, like, boy, I am glad I'm not like them. If you have that attitude in your mind and your heart right now about anybody, man, that's a, that is a, that's a harsh condemnation. Or when Jesus came into church one day, he saw two guys. One guy was at the front, and he was just pounding on his chest saying, Oh, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. And then the other guy in church was looking at that guy saying, Man, I am glad I'm not like him. How many times do we have that kind of attitude? And Jesus said the guy who was on his knees pounding on his chest was the one who went away justified, not the other proud guy. See, to deny ourselves, we have to abandon that self-righteousness. But we also have to abandon our sin. And we have to abandon this whole attitude. As I'm so terrible and I'm no good and I'm so awful. We have to abandon that too. Because sometimes that is just as much of an idol in our lives as the worship of how good we are. And some people cling to their own terribleness. And they miss out on the fact that, that God loves them above all else. And so you must be worth something because Jesus was willing to die for you. See, that inordinate focus on yourself, whether it's your own righteousness or your own depravity and, and, and your own whatever it is, it's, it's still a focus on yourself. See, we've got to change what we're looking at. To deny yourself is to stop looking at yourself quite so much. Denying ourselves means we have to give up the right to think that we can gain entrance into heaven by our own good works. There's no place for self-righteousness in the follower of Jesus. There's a call to abandon legalism and hypocrisy and sin. There's a recent story that's been breaking in the Christian world of a very famous apologist who went around the world preaching to millions and millions of people, leading people to Jesus, laying out a defense of the faith, and it turns out that he's been leading a double life the whole time. Taking advantage and, and, uh, uh, of women across the globe. This is the the, the message, you know, of, of, of abandoning this. This is the message Jesus preached in the Sermon on the Mount. When he, he said, blessed are the poor in spirit. Those are the people that realize they can't do anything without him. And they, they get their focus off of themselves about what, and, and, and focus on what God himself is doing. Grace is not extended to those who think that they are well, but those who know that they are sick. not the self-assured Pharisee that Jesus likes. Uh, if you think you know everything about Christianity and you got all the doctrines all nailed down and everything, well, good for you. But you know what? God is really not impressed by that. He wants a heart that is focused on him. Jesus is here when he spoke these words they needed to recognize that they could not gain God's favor through their outward conformity to the rituals and traditions of what they grew up in. How oftentimes do we have that idea that if we do the right thing and look the right way and we, we, we do all of the right actions that we're going to be okay then. And the reality is God looks 
inside of our hearts. And, and if we cling to any form of religion that is not rooted in the, race, the grace of God, we're, we're, we're clinging to something that is not going to be of any benefit in getting closer to the Lord. Because the traditions of man do not accomplish the righteousness of God. call to self-denial it's 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 horrible because when you start getting into it you begin to realize how self-centered you are the more you look at yourself the more you look at yourself and then once you're looking at yourself you're realizing hey i'm looking at myself you know and 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 it just leads into this 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 terrible revelation when you get down to the point of your own motives why am i doing anything that i'm doing and, and I think we have to come to this realization that in our lives, really, every single one of our motives is somewhat tainted by ourselves. That self. Mm. We have to be willing to break with our former way of life our way of looking at everything and turning to God from all lies, from all falsehood and and, and abandoning all of our old habits of how we get by. And we have to examine ourselves and then we have to repudiate. We have to deny ourselves. So pursuing Christ, it, it not only talks about embracing him as our savior, but also submitting to him as our Lord. See, that's two things, you know, you, you, you embrace Jesus as that loving Savior who does. He loves you right where you're at, but then he requires you to, to do some things. And that means we have to deny ourselves because ourselves stands in opposition to what God wants to do in your life. That self, man, it's, it's a beast. It's brutal. When we're saved, we, we used to be slaves to sin. But now we're transformed into slaves of righteousness. We, we, we really have to do the right thing. And if you don't, you're going to be miserable in your life. So his desires, his purposes, and his will begin to be dominant in ourselves. When we deny our, our, our own self, God's self begins to be evident in our lives. And his word and his will and his glory begins to to be our highest ambition. Um, I've been thinking a lot about death lately. <laughs> Welcome to some real cheerful news here, but 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 I have been because it's everywhere, you know, and 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 many of us. And, and some of you right here have experienced that in your families in the last week. And um, I've been thinking about this, and I've been thinking about my life in the context of the end of my life. I, I got to hang out yesterday with some old friends from, from, from back 30 years ago that have just been my friends through the years. And, and, and I was hanging out with them, and... and I was thinking that our children are now the age of what we were when we were hanging out with these people. And and realizing that there's less on the road ahead than there is in the road behind on this earth. And so when we come to know Jesus, we can declare what Paul declared. Even though when we look at the totality of our lives, we look back and in, in Philippians 2.21, Paul said, For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. You know, I was thinking of uh, PJ's grandma passed away this week. And Laura Jimenez's mom passed away this week. And, and, and I, I've known her since I was 11 years old. And what a, what a lovely lady. And, and just a dear Christian woman who's had impact beyond what 
any of us could hope in her life of, of, of teaching little kids in Sunday school through many, many years. And, 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 and I thought of this, for me to die, to live as Christ, and to die as gain. That's what Paul said. Isn't that crazy? And that was her life. And you know what? As hard as it is, for her to die has been gain. She's, she's reunited with her husband and with her loved ones, and, and, it's, and it's beautiful. She's doing really good. But, you know, can we really say that? I mean, and, and, and as we live out our lives right here, is to live Christ for us? Is that our focus? Or are we just trying to hang on to what we have right here? Because, you know what, it's going to be gone in a moment. Galatians 2.20, the Apostle Paul says, I've been crucified with Christ. And I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. See, this is denying yourself. I've been crucified with Christ. Now, I didn't die, but but my, my ownership of my own soul is what died. That ownership is what was crucified with Jesus. And guess what? I'm under new management. I don't own myself. I don't get to, to, to choose independent of the will of God about my life anymore. And I'm glad for it. And, and my life is good, and, but, I, but I don't want to brag about what's going on in my life because like Paul said later in Galatians, in, in Galatians 6.14, he said, May I never boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, through which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. And so, honestly, as I've been thinking about death this week, I'm also thinking about life. And I'm thinking about a great life and about what my life is, is going to be on the other side. And, I'm gonna, and I've been thinking about how important it is that the world that we live here is not the total focus of our life. Because if this world is the total focus of our life, we live and we die by the stock market this week or the outcome of an impeachment trial or by who wins The Bachelorette this year. I've never watched that show, just for the record. But the question then just keeps coming back to us. What is your focus? What is your focus in this world as you live out your lives? What is your focus? And a better way to say this is where is your focal point? The power of focus is so important. If you hold a magnifying glass up like this and you look at the ground, it looks all blurry and fuzzy. But if you get it down closer to the ground, you can burn a hole right in a leaf. I know a bunch of you guys are thinking, or you could burn an ant. I know what you guys are thinking. I was going with the leaf. But you can do that. And, and, and it's not any difference in the light. It doesn't change. It's not any difference in the lens or anything other than where the focus is. And see, that's your life right now. Where is your focus? Are you some diffused, out-of-focus blob? Or have you harnessed the power of God and by focusing in on Jesus, having a pinpoint, laser-focused that enables you to have an impact on this temporal world so that we can have an impact on eternity. Where is your focus? Is it yourself or is it Jesus? Because Jesus said, if you want to be my disciple, you have to deny yourself. If your focus is on yourself, you ask questions like, what is best for me? What is best for me in this situation? What's going to work out for me? Not what is going to bring God the most glory here. Sometimes, you know what? God wants not the, the, the best temporal thing for you. Sometimes he wants a, an eternal thing that doesn't become evident until way down the road. 
And we get all disappointed. We get all mad at God because he's not doing things the way we want it to be done. Frankly, I'm really glad he doesn't do things the way that I want everything done. And I'm glad he doesn't want do everything the way you guys all want it to be done. Because I don't want to be at your whim. And you don't want to be at mine. We want to be at God's whim. What's best for me is not always what's best. We, we oftentimes think about ourselves and we think about our ability. When something goes sideways, what's the first thing that we do? We try and figure out how to fix it by using our abilities and our strength and our resources. Maybe God just wants us to start thinking, Lord, what do you want to do here? When things are getting crazy around you, maybe God wants you to say, Lord, what, what do you have? Rather than trying to fix everything with our own abilities, I am... I'm very limited in my capabilities. I put up a flagpole this last week. I was very excited. Put cement in the ground, you know, the whole thing. And and it's in there, and the flag's up. It's got a little light on it. It's really cool. And then this morning, I I woke up hearing howling wind. It was like a massive hurricane at my house. And you know what my first thought was? Oh, I wonder if that thing fell over, that flagpole fell over, because I know about my ability to do mechanical things. But I want you to know that that Star Spangled Banner still waves, so it's, it's up, all right? It's not about my abilities. But we ask ourselves also, how does this impact me? How does this impact me and mine? What's the impact in my life? We, we see stuff going on. We don't really necessarily think about the worldwide impact of things. And, 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 and God forbid that we ever think about the impact on the kingdom of God. Our first response in most things is, is how is this going to impact me? And we ask ourselves, how can I save myself? That's where we all end up. You know, that's the original sin, by the way. It's, it's pride in thinking that we know better what's best for us than God knows. So Adam and Eve said, oh, yeah, it's much better that I eat that tree, that fruit from the tree of good and uh, the knowledge of good and evil. And they eat it and, and we're hosed forever. All right. And, and we do that so oftentimes in our lives. We, we just think that we know better than God. How And, we, and then we think. Well, we've gotten myself into this this mess. I can save myself now. Ah, That's kind of a symptom that you're thinking of yourself a lot, if these are your questions that you ask. So when we think about Jesus, so where our focus is, when our focus is on Jesus, we respond to the situations of life by faith. Now, what is faith? What is faith? Um, Hebrews 11.1 1 gives us the best definition. It says faith. Now faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. That's what he- Hebrews 11.1. 1, that's the only definition of faith ever in the Bible. It's the only definition. It's 17 words in the English. Six words in the Greek, only six words in that whole verse 11 or verse um, one of chapter 11, six words in the Greek. And in fact, there's really only three main words here. Three words, if you if you 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 home in on the, the main three words, ready, confidence, hope and assurance. Isn't that cool? That, that's what faith is. If you look at God and you have faith, you have confidence in him, you have hope that it's all going to work out, and you have assurance that it's going to be fine. That's what faith is. If you have those three things, man, you're going to be okay to make it through all the things that are going on around you. If you have confidence in God, hope he's going to work it out, and assurance that he said it's going to be okay, it's going to be okay. And that's what faith is. Best definition of faith I've ever heard. Confidence, hope, and assurance. Three words. 
And it's really an important thing to have faith, God says. It's, it's, the, it's the thing that is our focus. In Hebrews eleven six, just a few verses down, it says, And without faith, it's impossible to please God. If you don't have confidence, hope, and assurance in God, it's impossible to please him. Because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and rewards those who earnestly seek him. So we need to have this faith in God. And if it's so important, it's perfectly natural, we should be deeply concerned over whether or not we possess it. How many of you have great faith? Okay, a couple. All right. Good for you guys. I have weak faith in a great God. (laughs) That's kind of where I'm at because my faith, my faith wavers. My, My faith, my faith goes along with my blood sugar. You know, all of us, our faith just is indifferent. What, what is it that, that causes your faith? And most of the time it's, it's kind of dependent on our circumstances if we're really truthful. But our minds being what they are, we, we want to just get around to wondering, what is faith? And we try to define it, and then we ask that question, do I have it? You know, And we're trying to say, how do I fit into all of these things? And we hear a lot about faith. We hear all these great stories about people that have all this great faith to do it. But, but, but what is it really practically? And, and again, in Scripture, there's hardly no effort to define faith. And outside of Hebrews 11, 1, I don't know that there is any definition, but, but even there, faith is defined functionally, not philosophically. It's, it's a function. It, it, it means it's a statement of what it is in, oper- in, in operation, not what it is in its own essence. So, so it assumes that we have faith, and it shows what it results in rather than what it is. So we, we just probably would be wise if we just went that far and didn't try to go any further with defining what it is. But we're told in the scriptures where it comes from. In Ephesians 2, it says that faith is a gift of God so that none can boast. That faith is something that God gives us. In Romans 10, 17, it says faith comes by hearing. So it's a gift of God that we get from hearing stuff. And, and I love what Thomas Kempis, the 15th century theologian, said, I'd rather exercise faith than know the definition of it. So let's drop that idea of defining faith, okay? Let, let's, let's get away from that because you know what it is. But let's think about faith as it can be experienced in action. So I'm going to give you a practical, not theoretical application of faith, okay? And this will tie back into what are you looking at, all right? And it's a great example in the Old Testament, and it comes from snakes in the wilderness. Hey, snakes. Snakes, sharks, and clowns. Don't like them all, all right? I know some of you are clowns. You you dress up like clowns, and, and I like you as human beings. Don't like you so much as snakes, or as clowns. So, so. In Numbers chapter 21, Old Testament, children of Israel getting out of Egypt, marching through the desert, okay? They're all excited. Yay, we're out of Egypt. Go through the desert. Things kind of go bad. Oh, you know, not going well. Yay, oh, yay, oh. And so they're in one of the uh, stages. Finally, God got sick of it, honestly. He just got sick of all the whining. And... And in Numbers chapter 21, verse 4, it says, They traveled from Mount Hor along the route to the Red Sea to go around Edom. They're going around this area called Edom. But the people grew impatient on the way. As you're traveling this journey through this wilderness, man, the temptation is for you probably to get impatient. Verse 5, they spoke against God and against Moses. They were mad at God and mad at their pastor because he was leading them astray. And they said, why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? We could have died just as well back in Egypt. There's no bread, there's no water, and we detest this miserable food. And 
manna, manna, but manna cake, manna burgers, manna bagels. They had all that, and, and they just they just were sick of manna. Verse six. Then the Lord sent venomous snakes among them. What in the world? They were just whining a little bit, and all of a sudden, snakes everywhere. It's not good. They bit the people, and many Israelites died. The people came to Moses and said, We sinned when we spoke against the Lord, against you. Pray that the Lord will take the snakes away from us. So they were whining and complaining at Moses. The snakes came. Then they went to Moses and said, Fix it. Now, if I was Moses, I'd say, nah, too bad. <laughs> you guys are going to die. <laughs> Teach you to talk mess about me. And, <laughs> but Moses was a good dude, man. Moses prayed for the people. And the Lord said to Moses, make a snake. Uh, crazy. He, he said, make a snake and put it up on a pole. So in, in anyone who's bitten can look at it and live. That's it. Now, it's humiliating to these people. They're getting bitten by snakes. And God says, look at a snake and you're going to live. And they're like, no, we want to do something about this. And God says, no, no, just got to look at it. You can't do nothing. You just got to just. You just got to realize that I'm going to fix this and I got this and I'm the one that caused it anyways in the first place. And, and you got to look at this snake and that's the only thing you got to do. Just look at it. Focus on the snake. So Moses made a bronze snake and put it up on a pole. Now, that makes no sense to me. It seems crazy. Why would he do that? But God knew what he was doing. Make a snake, put it on a pole. Anyone who's bitten can look at it and live. Moses made a bronze snake, put it up on a pole. Then when anyone was bitten by a snake and looked at the bronze snake, they lived. That was it. Do you know how many people probably got bitten by a snake and and they said, go look at the thing. No way. That's not going to do it. I can't just let that be what saves me. I got to do something myself. And so they cut an axe in there and they had one of their friends who really liked them try to suck the venom out of their leg and, and, and nothing didn't work. They had to come by faith that what God said was going to be the answer. They had to deny themselves and do it God's way. They had to have faith. In the New Testament, this little bit of history is interpreted for us by no less an authority than the Lord Jesus Christ himself. In John chapter 3, he's explaining to his hearers how they can be saved. And he tells them it's by believing. And then to make it clear, he refers to this incident from the book of Numbers. In John chapter 3, verse 14, it's the red-headed little brother of John 3, 16. It says, just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up so that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. See, Jesus had this under control. The whole thing about the snakes was pointing further ahead to when Jesus was on the earth and died on a cross. He was pointing ahead thousands of years earlier to what was happening. See, he had this whole thing planned out, this whole trip to the cross when Peter grabbed him and said, you're not going to the cross. It's like, get behind me, Satan. I got, this is my plan. This is my story. And when we try to thwart the, the, the will of God by not focusing on God and focusing on ourselves, Jesus has to say to us through his spirit, get behind me, Satan. I got a plan here. And whether it's snake bites or a virus, We've got to put our focus rightfully where it belongs. And I'm not saying that the virus came because we're complaining. Please don't hear me say that. I'm just saying whatever circumstance it is in life that you're facing, 
the answer to the circumstance is to turn your focus onto Jesus who's lifted up in the wilderness. The Son of Man must be lifted up so everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. And then there's John 3, 16, which comes right after this. It says, for... God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him, whoever gazes upon him, whoever lifts up their eyes to him shall not perish but have eternal life. See, that's the requirement of God. As absurd as it may seem that we have to look to Jesus for our salvation and not do something on our own, we have to have faith that God will accomplish what he says he's going to accomplish. When we look at these verses, it, we make an important discovery here. And we, we notice that look and believe are synonymous terms. Looking in the Old Testament, at the Old Testament serpent is identical with believing in the New Testament Christ. It's where you have your focus. Looking and believing are the same thing. And when we understand that, while well, Israel looked at their external, through their external eyes... Believing is done with your heart. I like what A.W. Tozer said. He said it like this, that faith is the gaze of a soul upon a saving God. The gaze of a soul upon a saving God. And when we see this, we remember the passages that we read before and, and the meaning comes flooding back to us. The Old Testament, oftentimes it says, lift up your eyes to heaven. That phrase all through the Old Testament, through the Psalms and the prophets, lift up your eyes to heaven. In, in the New Testament, in John 5, verse 19, it says, Jesus gave him this answer. Very truly, I tell you, the son can do nothing by himself. He can only do what he sees his father doing, because whatever the father does, the son also does. See, Jesus himself modeled that. He saw what the father is doing, and that's what he emulated in his life. And from this, we learn that it's not a one and done kind of an act, but it's a continuous gaze of our heart at God. So whatever you're facing right now, whatever things are going on in your life, whatever things are impinging upon you, turn your gaze to Jesus. So what does that have to do with denying yourself? Because that's the first thing. That's what we're talking about today, honestly, just denying yourself. What does this have to do with denying yourself? What does it mean to deny yourself? Well, I'll tell you what it's not. Okay, here's what it's not. It's not self-loathing. It's not hating yourself. In fact, the second greatest commandment that Jesus gave was in Mark 12, 31. It, Jesus said, the first command is love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And the second is like this, or the second is this, love your neighbor as yourself. There's no greater commandment than these. Love your neighbor as yourself. You did, if you hate yourself, then that means you can hate your neighbor. No, you love yourself. Okay, right? You guys love yourselves. You should. I, I, I think you do. You, you, you just may not know that you do. I mean, if I was to say, hey, someone come up here, let me punch you in the nose as hard as I can. You'd say, ah, no, thanks. Okay. And, and you would say that because you love yourself. You don't want yourself to be harmed. And actually, you, you, even when you do self-destructive behavior in a twisted way, it's kind of you, you're, because you're loving yourself more than others. So it's not self-loathing. It's not, you, you don't hate yourself. So it's not that, and it's also not self-punishment. Okay, it's not self-loathing. It's not self-punishment. That's not denying yourself. Because, you know, you don't have to punish yourself, by the way. First of all, I, I'm going to ask a rhetorical question. I do not expect a response, and I don't want you to respond to this question. In your own mind, you can think about it. How many of you have ever done something rotten and despicable? Okay, we're all in that boat together, all of us, right? 
and, and we know that when people do something wrong, they should be punished for it. It's a, it's a natural thing, right, in, in our life. But look at this. In, in, in Romans 5, 8, this is what the Bible says about that. But God demonstrates his own love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. While you're a sinner and you're deserving punishment, Jesus took on your own punishment on the cross. All those beatings, all those lashes, all the nails through the wrist and the legs, the spear in the side, all of that was to take your punishment for your sin. You don't need to punish yourself because God already took that punishment and he forgives you. The price has been paid. Somebody paid for your sins. If you're a victim of of something in this world, you know, I want you to know something, that that person didn't get off for free. If they're a Christian, Jesus paid for the sin. If they haven't received Christ, they're going to pay for it someday down the road. And we're all in that same boat. We can either pay it ourselves or let someone pay it for us. Jesus offers that we, um, that he'll pay for our sin. And he took your punishment and mine on his own body on the cross. We don't have to punish ourselves anymore. If you're punishing yourself for something you did, you can stop it now because Jesus did that. The New Testament says when we do that, we crucify Christ anew. We don't need to do that anymore. Stop beating yourself up. Self-denial is not self-loathing. It's not self-punishment. But here's what it is. You ready? And this is the end. I'm done here with this. Here's what it is. It is disowning your right to rule yourself putting aside my right to rule myself. I'm turning my gaze to Jesus. And I'm directing my heart's attention to Jesus. That's denying yourself. It's not so much about the focus on yourself, but but it's disowning that right to rule yourself, and it's turning your eyes on Jesus and directing your heart's attention to Jesus. Him. Hebrews 12, 2 says, therefore, since we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, that's 12, 1, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that easily entangles. Let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. And here it is, ready in two, verse 2, it says, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith for the joy set before him. He endured the cross, scorning its shame and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. We can cast off the things that hinder us. We run the race and we fix our eyes on Jesus. So we close with just a question for you right here. You ready? Here it is. What are you looking at? What are you looking at? What are you looking at? Cast your gaze upon Jesus. Let's stand together. And let's pray. I read um, a a book by A.W. Tozer called The Pursuit of God. And he ends one chapter with this prayer. And I want to pray this prayer and then end with a prayer of my own. So bow your heads and close your eyes and let me read this to you. O Lord, I have heard a good word inviting me to look away to thee and be satisfied. My heart longs to respond, but sin has clouded my vision till I see you, but dimly. Be pleased to cleanse me in your own precious blood and make me inwardly pure so that I may with unveiled eyes gaze upon thee all the days of my earthly pilgrimage. Then I shall be prepared to behold thee in full splendor in the day when thou shalt appear to be glorified in thy saints and admired in all them that believe. Father, we come to you today distracted by so many things. But Lord, we come to you wanting to be your followers. And so, Father, today, as best we can, we're going to deny ourselves, and we're going to cast our gaze upon you. We're going to look at your face, Lord. We're going to disown our right to rule ourselves. We're going, to, we're going to gaze upon you and direct our heart's attention to our Lord and Savior, Jesus. So today, Lord, help us to begin a life that is centered in and focused in on you. We ask these things in Jesus' name.
Amen. Amen. If all I had was love, I'd have nothing to give. If all I have is Christ, and I have nothing to give. His presence is enough. He hides me. bless you. May God be